Hi, Stefan. Hi. My name is Tamara. I am here on behalf of Delilah and Company, and we are so happy to have you here. Thank you. I want to start with your roots a little bit because I saw that you attended Morehouse, and <laughs> and I am very curious about your experience at an HBCU and how that informed your work as a director. So can you speak to that a little bit? So to my surprise, not surprise, but to my learning experience, um, I went, to, you know, I lived along Island, so it's a predominantly white county, uh, Suffolk County. I went to community college first, and um, and then I decided to go to HBCU because I want to learn more about black people. Um, while I was at, HB at, at at Morehouse College in Atlanta, I learned that black people are very diverse. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, we have black people from not only from New York and LA or from the Midwest or from, you know, um, South South Chicago or, or from, from South Florida. And everyone is different from there, but it's also black people have different uh, insight in religion. I met black Buddhists. I met, um, actually, um, you know, was close friend to a Muslim brother, athe black atheists, um, and cultures as well. You know, I have black people from Africa and black people from Brazil, um, you know, Afro-Latinx. So it was like, so because of that, that, that informed me of, uh, of my work that I want to create diversity among black people. Good point because I had the opposite experience. I was always around, I, I come from Philly and I was predominantly in the black environments, black schools. So, and I and I'm jealous because I was supposed to be a Spelmanite, <laughs> but I went to Penn State and, Excuse um, me. yeah, <laughs> and That's but still the, a good school. no, it's a great school. But the, the point, the, the point is, you know, I was shocked to learn so much about the African diaspora and the fact that, like you said, there aren't just we're not just black Americans, we have so many different cultures yeah. and backgrounds. So that's amazing. Now, See You Yesterday started off as a short. Yeah. It was your thesis yeah. film, yeah. and it got to become a feature. Now, I'm curious, as someone who's also a director, did you already have the intention to have the short turn into a feature? Was it like a proof of concept, or was it something that became bigger than what you thought? That, my intention um, at NYU Film School, you have to, you have to create a thesis film. But everybody at NYU, they wanted uh, to do a feature film including me, myself. So I, so See You Yesterday started off as a feature film, written though, as a script. And then when I went to my professors and went to Spike, I told them, hey, I wanna make a feature film for my thesis. Um, I had the second job done in March and wanna shoot in July. <laughs> that was like, you're delusional. <laughs> Plus they, they pushed me first to do the short. They, they was happy I wrote a script, um, uh, the feature script, but they pushed me to do the short because all the previous short I've done for film school they weren't really strong or substantial, and I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't happy with it personally. Um, and they said to build your chops as a director, um, to even help you get this feature made on a reasonable budget, you might as well just do a short, um, and so you have a better chops as story and to storytelling, work, work, working with actors, and building your voice. And I'm so happy I did that because it allowed me to learn from my mistakes and and get to finally learn what my voice is as an artist and and be comfortable with that. Um, so when I came, when I start to work on the feature film again, and I work, I work with my um, a co-writer for Jacob Bailey. Um, it was like it was seamless. I knew the characters, I knew the world, I knew what kind of film, what kind of film I wanted to make, um, and I learned ultimately that I'm better as a writer with a co-writer. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So it's going through that trial and error, going through that. Um, uh, um, a period of a period of so many mistakes, I was able to um, build my craft. Okay. So, yeah. And to that point of you being persuaded and pushed to create a short, where you already felt like you know I'm ready for a feature, I'm ready to do this the the, the full way. But you said that going through that experience not only taught you some things, but it seemed like it humbled you a bit as an artist as well. What would you say to aspiring filmmakers who are you know? I think most young directors are very ambitious and they want to go straight to creating a feature film. So what would you say now that you have that experience, what would you say to them um, about starting off, I guess, small or starting off in, in one lane and then delving into the other? Uh, it takes 10 years for an overnight success. So take your time. Don't rush. Um, if you have to go to film school, go to film school. If you already have connection to the industry, be a PA or shadow a director on set. You know, have to learn the craft first. 
um, and the best way to learn a craft is doing shorts. It's, shorts are inexpensive. Um, just start small. If you only have a Ricky Dicky camera, make a Ricky Dicky film. It's not going to be substantial, but at least you're starting to learn. And and from there you grow and you grow and you grow. Um, and networking is also a big part of it too. So don't don't try because you want to get into filmmaking. Don't think you're able to make a first feature film within two years. <laughs> It's gonna take a much longer than that, and and something you know with, for me it took me about ten years for to be, for me to be successful, but it took me five years to make this feature film, you know what I'm saying? And for a lot of people, I mean for me it was like very slow process, but for a lot of people that's quick, because you know there are a lot of um, filmmakers that haven't even got started from until their eleventh, twelfth, maybe the fifteenth year, you know what I'm saying? So so don't rush, take your time and. And you would get there. Okay, thank you. I think that's really important for people to hear and be reminded of from another artist who is blowing up right now. So congrats to you. Um, I, you know, all right. So I read about your relationship with Spike Lee and the fact that I mean, since the beginning, oh. from you being a fan of Do the Right Thing and being from Brooklyn to being his mentee, like how how did that come about and how did that make you feel to go from an aspiring filmmaker, someone who just wanted to be around him and learn, you know, wanting an internship to becoming his full mentee, him becoming an EP on CE yesterday. Like, how was that? How, how does that feel first? And then how did that come about? I'm still pinching myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's still surreal. Like, you know, he's my hero and I get to work with the heroes. They always they always say, don't work with the heroes, be disappointed. Uh, and for me, that's not the case. I had to, Well, I had to work my ass off. Um, before, you know, I had to prove myself to him and, and to people around him as well um, that works with him. So, wow, like, it's, it took persistence. Like, when I was at Morehouse, I asked, asked him for an internship three times, each, once each semester. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get that the con connected with him? Was he in the uh, program? No, I, there was a um, shout-out to Mr. Thomas <laughs> at Morehouse College. He's a sports, journal, sports journalism uh, professor and and he knew that I, I strongly wanted to be a filmmaker and he said hey Stefan Spike is showing Kobe doing work at King's Chapel you should go, you should go over there and, and see and, and meet him I said absolutely so I went over and he showed a film and we did the Q&A and afterwards I bum rushed him <laughs> and I said Spike you know I'd love to have an internship at 40 acres you know hook a brother up and he said here's my email send me your resume I haven't heard shit from him yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's always like that. Yeah, yeah. It took like persistence. Yeah, it took persistence. Like two more times when I finally asked him for a third time, I got it. Yeah, yeah. And and um, I worked at Forty Acres. I worked um, as an intern there, um, and and for like five days a week, Monday to Friday, um, eight a.m. to six p.m. I worked for free. Wow. Um, and then I lived on Long Island that time too, so it's an hour and a half commute out. And on the weekends, I had to work um, in a nursing home's kitchen to make some money, okay. you know. So it was a lot of hard work. And then, I, and, and when I got to NYU, um, I asked him, "Can you be my mentor?" And he said, "Yeah, I got you." Wow. Yeah, yeah. So. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that story. You hear that, guys? Yeah. Don't give up. Persistence is key. <laughs> um, so I'm curious about some of the challenges that you face as a director, um, going from having a short to a feature but as a black filmmaker what are some of the directorial challenges you feel that you came across that's a good question i try not to pay attention to that okay. me personally you know when um, film school was it was a lot of challenges where just you know professors not trying to not really in tune to what you're trying to do and i'm just like okay i'm just not going to rock with you i'm going to rock with professors that will and, and also my there's classmates where um, that came in with the program that wasn't feeling my vibe too. I'm sorry, right, fuck you. I'm not feeling your vibe. I'm gonna do what I gotta do. And um, there was one time I was working on a, uh, a, a a second year film, and my DP and and another gentleman at that time, uh, who was my um, my AC right now, he won a whole bunch of fucking Emmys. I don't even know how that happened. And he oh and he was expressing me how come you always always put black people in your film. And I just want, and I wanted to tell them to suck my dick, but I needed them to work. So to this day, I, I, I'm not really good, good friends with them after remembering that. And it was like, I want to ask, how can you only put white people in your shit? Kiss my ass. Um, 
So it, it, there's, 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 there's a lot of other racist things I have to overcome uh, through it. But I was like, there's, there are people who is what is what is it about your focus? There are, are there are, are you focus on people who will hate you, or are you focus on people that will support you? I decided to focus on people who support me, and I pushed that way. You know what I'm saying? And that's all I that's all I cared about. And I got because of my focus, because your focus um, determines your outcome. Guess who said that? Jedi Master Qui Gon Jinn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to talk about See You Yesterday. Such a powerful film. Had me in shambles. You know, because I'm from Philly and I have had firsthand experience seeing, you know, the effects of police brutality. I've also seen inner city violence. Well, first of all, I've also experienced it firsthand, but just you know, the racial bias and like always being seen as someone who's in the wrong. I want to talk about as heartbreaking as the film was, I felt like you did a really good job with, with capturing hope. And I want to talk about that from the lens of a black woman, um, from the cinematography of the project, which I thought had some amazing moments from the moments in the kitchen to the moments in the living room between mom and son. And one of my favorite moments was the scene between Calvin and CJ when they were at the sink and he was telling her, you know, I see you doing this. I see you doing that. You're going to make it. And she's like, you can too, though. And that was such a quiet moment that I felt like really impacted me. So thank you for putting that in there. But it was powerful for me as a black woman because I think that we forget how influential we are, no matter what age, but we forget the power that we have as a union and, and the influence we have. And the fact that she was so young and he believed in her. And that moment she said, you too, he had a like a, a glint of hope in his eyes and he was like, maybe, right? And I think, you know, it was really important to showcase that moment and I felt like it really showed the void that we have in the black community of black men and not having that hope and confidence. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, what was going through your head when you, you know, wrote that when you and Frederica wrote that and you know in general when you created see you yesterday what that was like wanted just wanted to um, be a quiet film honestly it wasn't I wasn't trying to make this a big giant X adventure film um, and deal with black people uh, my I just went to the core of my training was um, you take really interesting characters and you make and you make them do the most mundane things um, and it'll be a most powerful scene just have to have that one scene in that script or maybe several scenes just two people talking to the room and that's more powerful um and honestly that's that's what it was i was just testing it and the more i wrote it the more i realized i need that scene for um for the audience to know the relationship of these two um so that that relationship can carry throughout the whole film and you know especially especially the relationship between you know a, a, um, a black woman and black man i've always been surrounded by amazing black women who touched my life. Um, my mother, yes. she refinanced her home to help me make the short. Yes, she did, which is amazing. crazy. Black woman. Black woman. <laughs> and it was two black women in my life that encouraged me to go to Morehouse College. So, and, and every time a tragedy happens, there's always the black woman that be there for the black man. Yeah. I'm curious about what you would say to people who see your film and they say they're tired of seeing trauma porn or black pain or they're tired of seeing this agenda being pushed on screen or, you know, they feel like we're just and it's not just other other races. Sometimes our own people say that I'm tired of seeing black men dying. Right. What what do you would you say to people who say that about watching your film? I think that point is valid. Um, and I agree to a certain extent. Um, and I, he, I understand and hear that pain because I too want to see more films besides that. Uh, however, um, I'm not that kind of artist to not be um, honest about our black experience. Um, I don't feel that, in my opinion, um, and many people will disagree, which is fine, that because, because you put just black characters in a movie and not make it nuanced, that's already being political or whatnot. And I, I just I don't I, I don't agree to that like um, like just because we just have black characters or something um, and we just you know let them be doesn't mean that it's, it's groundbreaking it could be quite the opposite um, and I just felt for this particular film I just felt um, I had something to say and I needed to say it because 
when I first wrote the script, it wasn't even about police brutality. It was about something else. And during the time when Eric Garner and Mike Brown was getting murdered, it bled into my script. Um, and I felt like I needed to add something to say, regardless if people are going to be upset with it or not. Um, you know, and I also tell those tell folks who um, are tired of, of seeing um, black pain on screen, once again, that's valid, then they need to make the movies themselves. I'm not the director. <laughs> and, and to that point, the ending, I felt like, you know, back to the topic of hope and also just how you ended it, I felt was very powerful. And I know that there was a, a bit of a controversy with regards to how people took the ending, which I, I know you, I, I, I would love as an artist. <laughs> you know, there are people who felt like, oh, did it end like this? Or did she save her brother? Or what, why, you know, why did it end like this? I felt like it was powerful because it's reality, right? You have black women at the forefront fighting again. And it's like, let's 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 choose our ending let's choose our ending in reality let's actually do something about it so what was what why why that ending first of all what is your interpretation of the ending it was i felt like it was very reflective of reality the fact that you know there is no happy ending right because this is still happening and if it wasn't still happening we wouldn't have been able to tell this whole story it, it would be no point right so i felt like if we had calvin come back to life then there would not have been that sense of like, oh, I, I, we need to do something, right? There needs to be some conversation happening. I felt like it was more galvanizing to see an, an, an open-ended ending. And also, I, I really love the alternate ending with the time travel, the fact that that moment where we thought we would save Calvin, then Bash gets killed. And I felt like that was really powerful because it's like, it turned the lens on ourselves too. Cause it's like, it's not just a film about police brutality, it's a film about our, our own community as well. We still have inner work that we need to do. So I felt like you did a brilliant job. I feel like there weren't endings there and people just, you know, chose what they wanted to see type of thing. I want people to have an open mind to, to the ending. Um, not, don't be dismissive of the choice of the ending. Uh, don't call it lazy. Don't call it, it's, it's lacking. There's a, there's, you know, I've been making this movie for five years and it's been through the ranks of approvals. That There's there's more to it than that. Uh, for me, uh, for me to give an ending, um, it, could go, it could go either way. If I showed her saving the brother and absolutely winning the day, no one, because there's rules like somebody, you save someone's life, someone else is get replaced. You know, if I showed her absolutely winning, nobody dies, um, it will be an, an offensive oversimplification of what the film is about. And I don't want people to say, oh, she wins, all's well, ends well. You know, honey, uh, how's the chicken going? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but if I showed her sacrifice herself or if I show her winning but someone else gets killed in the process, then I'm leaving to the, to the black audience a sense of no hope. And I don't want that. So I scaled back and had it ended where it is because I wanted to open up the audience to have a conversation about it because police brutality is still happening. And I need, and, and our focus has changed because there's so much other things as a nation that we have to focus on, which is fine, but I needed to keep this conversation going. And for her to run it towards the camera, she's running towards you for help. I need your help. I, I, I made this movie for five years. I know every nook and cranny, okay? Right. <laughs> every single frame was discussed. Like, you know, it's, 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 it, was a lot, it was a lot of work to it. So um, I just want people to do something about it. And a very simple way for do something about it is to go vote. Yeah. Or if you want to do more than that, do, do what Trayvon Martin, Martin's mother's doing. She's being a politician now. She's running for office. We need more black people in the room. You know why, you know why these abortion laws are happening right now? Because we're not in the room. Right. Have you seen Hamilton? I have not yet. Never heard a song? I want to be in the room where it happens. We got to be in there. That's very true. That's very true. Yeah, so, there we go. All right. So, what would you say? You know, first of all, I want to know what's next after this, right? And, like, how do you continue to push forward uh, through these conversations onto your next story? More black sci-fi. <laughs> I'm doing more black sci-fi. I'm doing more black action adventure. You know, I have an agent now in Hollywood. 
you know god bless her she knows who she is and she sent me around through a lot of executives out there i just came back from la with a meeting and i met a lot of um executives who support you know black stories and 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 who are black executives in the room um not you know we still need not more and in more powerful positions but so far so far so good so that's my goal right now i have a question about advice you would give to aspiring filmmakers or even young filmmakers now and how to be bold not just not just when they're making the film or making their project but in between that process and making these connections because we know this world is the entertainment world is all about who you know and how to get in those rooms etc cetera, etc cetera. and I was really inspired by the fact that you know you kind of manifested the, the fact that you were inspired by Spike Lee and that you were inspired by Back to the Future that you were inspired by these films that you know informed your work and see you uh, yesterday and the fact that you were able to get Michael J Fox in your film and you were able to get Spike Lee to produce your film. Um, you know, what would you say to filmmakers who also have that that vision, like, oh, you know, I have a person who I'm inspired by, I would love to get in a room with them, I would love to also have them be a cameo on my film, um, but they're not as ambitious as you. What advice would you give, or, you know, what would you say to those young filmmakers who could be very talented, but maybe they're, they're just not as bold? Closed mouths don't get fed. That's it. That's the point, right? <laughs> you gotta ask. Did you? Did, I mean, did you have? I guess was there any moment that you felt afraid or you doubted? You know, going out and like actually either speaking up for yourself or asking for something, or you just was all fearless in your attempts. It wasn't more about me being um, afraid or doubting. It was more of like if I don't do this, if I don't try, I don't know what the outcome is going to be i don't want I, I i want to be happy and if i want something i'd ask for it i want to be happy bare bone like how 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 do i um how do i get michael j fox i didn't know i was going to get him i mean somebody suggested write a letter so i sat down my ass and write a letter and you know and you know how you know how um uh, i was not planning netflix spike came to me and he said this should be a studio movie. I was like, okay, if you can make it happen, go ahead, make it happen. And he made it happen. And um, ask, and you shall receive. And if one door closes and the next door closes, keep going. This all you need is one yes. All you need is one yes. You're gonna get rejection a lot of times. That's very true. And then my last question about um, you know what you did in the film and like the messages that were in the film. I felt like you also. Uh, made a point about young black, first of all, both of the kids were brilliant, but the fact that they were in science and like, you know, Michael J. Fox's character said, you guys are the smartest two kids in the school. Don't tell me when I said that. <laughs> no, I love the film, so I, like, I have these moments that I kept going back to. Um, did you have, did you do that intentionally? Have a, you know, a young black prodigy in like a STEM program? Did you have something that you wanted to say to kids out there who might be interested in science? I wanted to uh, say simply is that um, there are other avenues in life you can do to have a fulfilling life besides being a musician or a ball player. And uh, nothing's wrong with, with that. There's nothing wrong with being a musician or a ball player, but we often, I often see movies that, you know, it's about young black kids. They dream to be a basketball player, a football player. They dream to be a rapper. They dream to be a fashion designer. Once again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that there's other brilliant things that they can do and we need more black scientists you know that's why i have cj named after madam cj walker you know what i'm saying there's um there's lonnie johnson who created the super soaker he's cool too black man created a super soaker multi-millionaire or billionaire and a lot of us don't know that and that's the man who who, who changed culture how many people like lonnie johnson or 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 um, the, the the brother who invented the traffic light, or the brother who invented um, the the um, uh, video game cartridges for Super Nintendo, um, for um, for Game Boy, because it that was a brother who invented that. You know what I'm saying? Like how how we need more minds like that in in, in science. We, you know we need more minds like that in Congress. 
we need more minds like that to be politicians. We need more. We need more black politicians. That's why I, I what I love those moments in your film where you had the kids telling each other like, "Look, you can do this," or you know, "We're doing this." Even down to oh my god, CJ was such an amazing character. She embodied what it meant, I feel like, to be a young, smart black woman. She was very resilient. And I thank you for portraying your characters in such an authentic way. And, you know, thank you for being so persistent, for being true to us. Um, and thank you for making such a multi-layer and opening up another door for other creatives, for other young black creatives and also young black scientists or engineers or mathematicians. I felt like you made it very exciting to do something like that. Thank you, thank you for being here with us. Is there anything, uh, any last words that you wanna say to people watching your journey right now and to other, you know, young, it, that, it doesn't even have to have a color, right? But young creatives out here really trying to do what you're doing now. And it's always a journey, right? And I, and I, I really want to emphasize the fact that this is not the end for you. You still have, you know, goals. You still have things. And I think that people see people make it and they're like, oh, this is it, right? But you're probably like, no, I have this. This is the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> journey. Success is another journey. I'm going with that shit right now. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for being here on behalf of Delilah and Company. We really enjoyed your story and we wish you the best of luck moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>